My name is Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. Our guest today on this first episode in the new year is Baroness Bryony Worthington. She's spent her career working on sustainability, uh, biodiversity, and climate change. She is uh, a sitting peer in the House of Lords. She also chairs a charity called Ember, which produces data and information on uh, the energy system. And she advises Quadrature, uh, the Quadrature Foundation on grants. And we'll be hearing about that during the course of the interview. She is also probably most famous as lead author of the 2008 Climate Change Act, a historic piece of legislation which meant that the UK was the first major economy in the world to put climate change into law. Please welcome Baroness Bryony Worthington. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. So, Bryony, welcome to Cleaning Up. Well, thank you, Michael. Thanks for inviting me. Great pleasure to have you on. And this is quite a uh, historic day as we film this. You'll actually be, we'll be showing this in the new year. Um, but today, as we film it, is the day of the announcement of the sixth carbon budget, is it not? It certainly is, yes. And uh, I'm just prior to that, we had the uh, UK's Paris pledge as well. Our NDC was announced. So it's been a big week. It has been a big week. And, you know, it's quite incredible because, you know, what was the, so the, the Paris pledge was um, this 68% um, reduction on 1990 by 2030. And then yep. the Climate Change Committee budget is 2035, which mm -hmm. is a, what is it? It's a 78, 78% mm -hmm. uh, cut. I mean, these are big numbers. Is this, I mean, it's, uh, how yeah. are you feeling about them? Yeah, no, they, they are big numbers. And actually what was useful about the uh, NDC was that um, the CCC did it, re rebased it according to 2019 levels. And it's actually a 42% cut on, uh, on 2019. So we're, we're looking at, you know, 42% in a decade, which is, not bad, really, you know, if you think about it. Well, yes. And, you know, I suppose, you know, part of the um, part of the context here, just so that the, uh, the the audience knows, is we were sat on the strategic advisory group for that um, sixth carbon budget. But it really all goes back to, you know, people throw around these budgets and the climate change committee and so on. It actually all comes, uh, they, all of this flows from the UK's Climate Change Act 2008, does it not? Mm. Yeah, a lot of it does. Well, like certainly the sixth carbon budget does. And, and the, the reason we were able to uh, write an NDC for Paris so quickly and easily is because we had the fifth carbon budget, uh, which coincides with the Paris pledge. So, yeah, the, the Climate Change Act has really created a really strong infrastructure for us to set these sorts of targets and not just set them, but also then bring in the policies to meet them, because that's the really important part, right? You can set any number you like, but if you don't actually then follow through, bring in the policies, uh, you won't get there. So, so the Climate Change Act is, was designed to both set targets and give government the powers to get there. So you were the lead author on that. Um, is this, and be honest here, is this the architecture? I mean, is this working the way you thought it or the way you hoped it would work? Or are you sitting here going, wow, this is just kind of, this is just, yeah. this is just flowering and doing some stuff that we never envisaged. Which is it? Um, well, it's a bit of both. I mean, firstly, I can confess and say that the the whole architecture was based on Kyoto, right? The five year budgets were just a complete lift from the way that Kyoto was phrased. And all we did was we analysed what went wrong with Kyoto, which was it being the UN. They only set one budget, which is completely useless, right? If you don't set a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth budget, there's no point in setting the first because there are no consequences. You know, it just a single five year budget is useless. So we just said I, the idea we had or that I had was we would set nine consecutive budgets right from the outset and constrain the area under the curve uh, over over that period, over 45 year period, and that that would create the constraint on government. And you could borrow between the budgets, but overall, our commitment to the atmosphere was fixed. And then I went into government, of course, this vision of constraining the area under the curve got watered down a little and we ended up with three consecutive budgets on a rolling basis 
which was better than nothing. And, uh, and, you know, I was really happy with that. And it, and it's been that process then of turning that concept into the reality of, well, who advises on the budgets and how do they get set? And the, the, the architecture we built was really focused on pr process. So you must do this by this date. And if you don't do that, then you're in breach. And, you know, all of these sort of legal, it's a kind of legal metronome really that makes yeah. you keep going, even if you don't want to. So it sort of ties the hands of government into making things happen on a regular basis. And that was the concept. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a success, but it's, it's partly because it was already a good idea. We just adapted it really. So, and this is now you, th that was passed into law in 2008, but it started, I mean, the first carbon budget was when, was 2010 to 15, if I'm not wrong? Uh, yeah, it was, it, the, it would have been eight to 12. Eight to it, 12. So it, it, you know, like Kyoto used to do, you, you take the midpoint year and you bridge either side of it. So ah. the aim is, yeah. So it's so it's it's five over the over the decade or, or the five yearly milestones. So it goes eight to twelve. I should know this, having just sat on the strategic the strategy <laughs> group for the sixth <laughs> budget. But you said that it was nine of them, and so that pretty much runs out in twenty fifty, right? Yeah, that was the we say the nine would have taken us from two thousand five all the way to twenty fifty. Yeah, but but, but we didn't have down. net zero twenty fifty at that point. I mean, we could have no. we could have had a government that turned around and said, you know what, net zero twenty seventy is good enough. And so then yeah, we had been... sixty at that point. So that in legislation, when we went when we published the draft bill, it had a sixty percent cut by twenty fifty, which was really inadequate. Sixty percent um, by twenty fifty, yeah. and now we're sitting here, and everybody is just kind of like, okay, it's a hundred percent. It's hundred now by twenty fifty. No big deal. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, which is which is amazing, right? That just tells you how much we've come in the last fifteen years. That technologies have changed. The price of, of the adapt, you know, the price of moving has changed. Confidence has boosted. We've got jobs off the back of the investments we've made. So the whole thing has become a sort of spiral in, in you know, an upward spiral of, of success, which is really amazing. And I don't think anyone, I don't think we really thought that would be happening so quickly. Well, it's, it's funny because I was completely outside that process. But had you asked me, I would have said, oh, no, no, this is going to be much cheaper than anybody says. And, you know, at the time, McKinsey was producing these kind of $300 carbon prices by the end of the process. And I say, no, it's just not going because there's path dependency and there's learning. Uh, and so I was out there saying this stuff's going to get much cheaper than people think. But I wasn't really plugged into that process in any way at that time. Yeah, well, we, we had to pick a number. We had to pick a number for 2050. And the only thing we had then was an RCEP report, um, which uh, the Royal, Royal Convention on Environmental Pollu Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which had happened in the early 2000s, and that had given us the 60% number. And we just just didn't want we didn't have time to do any new numbers. Um, and of course, when when it went through Parliament, uh, lobbying started and it got moved to 80. So it left Parliament with an 80% cut by 2050. And then now, you know, several years later, we were able to ratchet it to 100%. And I, I'm confident we'll ratchet it again. We'll, we'll be at minus 120, been, minus 140, for sure. It's, it's, been, it's been one of the features of each carbon budget is that whatever numbers were in the previous one, it's either become cheaper or we've been able to go deeper or both, hasn't it? I mean, it's pretty yeah, much consistent yeah. throughout the how many we've had. Well, the, the sixth now, uh, it's been a feature throughout, hasn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, the... The funny thing was when it when the first three were set, so you know that the, the architecture was put in law, but the actual budgets weren't, and it was up to the CCC to advise on them. And they made a kind of rookie error because they said uh, they gave two budgets to government and said you can either do an interim budget, which is what we suggest this is, and or you can do an intended budget, which is much tougher. And we'd rather you did the intended one. And of course, government went, well, you're giving us two options. We're going to take the easiest one. So, so they so they introduced these quite lax budgets for the first three, which meant that we we kind of met them so easily. We were we were over complying because we were taking coal off the system in parallel. So as soon as you're doing that, you're you're always going to be you know you're getting the easy things out early. And we could have gone much more ambitious early on. And this is what doesn't come across is that people assume oh it's easy to, it'll be easier to get to D for later. But actually, when you've got low-hanging fruit right lying around that are so obvious, you can go deeper, faster, um, and, and not wait for these technology cost curves to come down, because there are always things lying around that should have been done that can be done. And of course, you just said that we've now got this sort of 40% odd to get between, you know, over the next um, uh, decade. Um, and, you know, doesn't it get harder? I mean, we've got rid of coal. Um, and, you know, I can sort of see how transportation is actually not going to be that hard. People are making a big fuss about it. Um, yeah. But heating and industry 
and aviation and shipping, surely they're going to just at some point, we're going to hit the wall, aren't we? Well, I don't think so, because if you also think about what's happening in the other side of the equation, which is the sink side, you know, it, it's always net, right? It's net zero. So if you can remove and store more carbon, you can allow yourself a little bit more leeway on the emission side. And if we've only just started scratching the surface on that bit, and within a decade, we'd have worked out it's pr pretty easy to shift agricultural subsidies to store carbon. Uh, it's pretty easy to, you know, to start thinking about industrial processes that use carbon instead of emitting it. So I think we'll find removals and sinks are actually coming on stream just at the right pace to make sure we do get to zero and go beyond, really. Oh, that's very interesting because that's a that's a, that's still a kind of cutting edge or controversial view that that it is okay uh, to rely on removal um, because you know certainly the IPCC models they've all got vast amounts of removal and you know there are those who say well you know removal is just that's just kind of a way of fooling ourselves into continuing this lifestyle, flying around, doing all the things we like to do. But you're confident that removal is a real thing. Oh, it has to be. It's the only like. Science, if you wanted to set a science based target today, you need a time machine or you need removals. That's that's the reality, because for, we've for, already for one and a half degrees or for two degrees. Yeah, for both, for both. I mean, if you look at the IPC study that everyone says, oh, we need to get we need to get the world to net zero by 2050. It, if you if you look beyond 2050, there's then gigatons of removals assumed. Yeah. Uh, to get us to a stable climate, to get that's us below a one those temperatures. Scenario. For a two degree scenario, you can, and in well, fact, there's also, by the way, there's also um, at least one modeling group that has said we can get there. We just have to be much more aggressive on energy efficiency and a whole bunch of things. And we well, could get there without the removals. Sure, but you're looking at a precipitous, almost vertical yeah. fall in emissions globally. And who thinks that's likely in the next couple of decades? I mean, it's just not going to happen. So, I mean, I would like it to be falling at 10% a year, don't get me wrong, but it's not. It's falling, even in Britain, it's falling at, what, 3 4% a year, no. if that. So, and if and we're at the vanguard of this, uh, you can't see it happening anywhere else. So I, I just think removals is a, is a massive part of the equation. But the, the challenge, though, to not take the foot off, you know, you don't want to let any pressure off the emitting sectors. Yep. So you set dedicated oh. removals budgets. That's the way to do it. So you have parallel efforts going on the decarbonization and the removals and you and you keep them separate so you're getting investment in both yes the problem i have is that these direct air capture folk i mean they're currently at kind of 600 dollars a ton and then they uh, paint this picture about how they're going to get to 150 160 i think i haven't heard of anything realistic but by 2050 and i'm thinking you know this is really a stretch to believe we're going to be doing this and you know not doing a bit of it you know so that we can sell that carbon capture to rich people who still want to fly to mystique i'm talking about really doing you know gigatons of carbon direct air capture i'm finding that really really hard to square to be quite honest yeah no I, i'm i'm similarly skeptical i just don't like to rule out anything because i think human ingenuity it, it, we like a good problem to solve and I, I, my fear is actually the methane concentrations are going to you know we're going to have to some, do something about that short-term forcing from methane and if there's an engineered solution out there that can actually keep pace with the methane fluxes i'm not going to say no to that because it's very hard to know how else you you really stop that from being a tipping point so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm open to engineered solutions. I think is fair to say, but similarly, I agree. It, it can't it can't be at any price, and uh, you've got to really have a sensible plan for how you're going to get to scale and see some cost reductions. Well, surely on methane, we just got to stop. We just got to stop emitting methane. That's the first step, which is just an extraordinary. I mean, you, that's a problem that I believe is going to yield quite quickly, um, because now we've got these satellites that can see where the methane comes from. Uh, it becomes much harder for the oil and gas companies just to kind of, um, you know, uh, emit it. Yeah, but that's not the problem, is it? It's the permafrost. It's it's the natural feedback cycles that you might oh, see. Okay. We'll, yeah. we'll go down a rabbit hole because they don't. Yeah, really, exactly. They they won't start on on they won't start on a decadal time frame. I mean, that none of the science says that they'll be decadal. All of it shows, you know, that's a kind of hundred year, two hundred year. It's a real problem, but it's not the problem for this century. Uh, uh, no, in, well, but uh, I mean, it, well, we'll see, won't we? Look at what's happening in the Arctic. You've got anomalies that are really off the scale <laughs> happening just now, which you know, I don't think any Arctic scientists expected it to be happening at this pace. So. The science is really uncertain. Everyone I've spoken to, they really don't know. 
like I say, that's a rabbit hole because every paper that I've read, everybody who wants to, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, ooh, feedbacks, but every paper I've read and including, you know, summaries by Johan Rockstrom and the planetary boundaries and so is actually that, you know, the worry is that we could do things this century that, that cause us problems in future centuries. I, you know, absolutely. But the, but the, the amazing thing on methane, I'm going to give you an amazing fact. Did you know that um, if you go into Canada, there are provinces where it's not just that you flare methane, you actually just vent it. It is. Oh, yeah. It, it is incredible. You have oil and oh, gas yeah. companies just venting methane and that is a legally allowed thing in Canada. So if there's any Canadians watching this, just stop that. That's absurd. Yeah. No, let's not get too diverted onto yeah. it. But yeah, but, uh, yeah. I, you're right. There's loads of stuff. But let's, let's come back to the Climate Change Act and your role in it, because, you know, we dive mm. straight in and, and that's mm. great. You know, we got started. But what were you doing that put you in a position to um, to to be lead author on that? How did that because, you know, you, you studied English, uh, you um, suddenly end up writing the Climate Change Act. I mean, there must have been something that happened in between those those episodes in your life. Yeah, yeah, no, lots happened. Uh, and I should say, lead author is an, you know, it's an interesting term. I was a civil servant. I had a I had a grade three who was my boss, you know, who was responsible for taking this whole thing up to the Secretary of State. I was a part of a team of about 10 people. Um, I worked on certain parts of the bill. I commented on others. Um, you know, I wasn't, I, I, the, the reason I'm described as the lead author is because I suppose I'd started the campaign in front of the earth for a climate change act as a campaigner and had this concept of how it should look when I arrived in that team, unlike all the other civil servants who are all scratch, you know, brought in from departments and put together. So, so, you know, in a sense, I had a lot of, um, you know, I had a lot of already pre-thought ideas when I arrived at the team, but it was definitely a team effort. So I, you know, I want to take full credit and, and, you know, it went through the machinery with a really good secretary of state and really good spads in all the departments. And it all helped to make sure it came out in, in a fit for purpose way. But yeah, to answer your question, um, I mean, I'd, I'd been, I'd been working on wildlife conservation uh, for most of the nineties. And as a, uh, you know, as a policy person, you know, calling for new laws for wildlife. And then, I remember distinctly sitting in a meeting with some uh, English nature uh, scientists and talking about science of sites of scientific interest and how you know we need to preserve them and they said well you know all of this is going to be completely uh, disrupted by climate change anyway so it's all a bit material immaterial and uh, I remember thinking in the meeting well hang on if that's true why am I wasting my time you know trying to get all these protections in for ecosystems and species uh, cl clearly climate change is the thing I need to work on so I switched then at that point in the late 90s to being totally focused on climate. And as soon as you look at climate, you look at the data and it just says, this is an energy problem. First and foremost, you know, it's gonna be an, a, an agriculture and nature problem now, but what then it was clearly an energy system problem. It was clearly a power sector problem. So I just started writing campaigns for Friends of the Earth that got us focused on getting, getting coal out of power. And, um, and in parallel was really frustrated that the government of the day had no concept of what was actually the driving forces of why emissions were bouncing around and had no policy for addressing the relative price of coal and gas. You know, they just didn't even, it didn't even come into their thinking because for them, climate change was about energy efficiency or, um, you know, making sure people cycle to work or some really small policies that were never going to really get at the problem. So I thought we needed a top down a managed data led approach to the problem that would force government into looking at the really important things that were driving you know emissions up and not doing this you know adding up all these small measures and hoping crossing your fingers and hoping um so so that's so at friends of the earth we sort of launched the campaign for that top-down legislated uh, uh, campaign and then i kind of was getting a bit sort of bored in the ngo land so i went to work for a power company for a while and actually well, what scottish happened and there, southern, scottish and southern, that was scottish and southern yes was that under, under was that under Ian Marchant? It was under Ian Marchant, who was, you know, one of the best bosses I've ever had and uh, was just fantastic. And he, I think he, I was, I used to argue with him. We were both on an off-gem advisory panel and I uh, used to have a good old argument with him. And one day he said, well, look, you come up to, um, you come up to Perth and uh, you can tell me how to run my company and I'll tell you how to be a better campaigner. So I thought that was a good offer. So I took that, I took him up on that. And uh, at the end of it, we sort of thought, well, you know, maybe I could come and help and, I think he just wanted some. Did Scottish and Southern have any coal at that point? Because I mean, oh, yeah. all of that analysis that you've that you've done, top down, you want to be data driven. I mean, it's basically at that point in 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 the you know in history, 
it's just so obvious that the problem is coal. And by the way, the yeah. problem is uh, probably about to become, since that's the late 90s, it's about to become Chinese coal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was very focused on the domestic agenda at the time, right. and and the, 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 yeah, the same analysis hold, holds true globally and still does to this day. But for for me, in my little world of you know, how can I how can I actually affect change? It, it was always going to be about UK policy, and then, and then obviously as, as my career has developed, I've taken a much greater interest in the global picture and been fortunate enough to sort of have jobs where I could think more about that. But in those days, it's just it was so obvious what we needed to do in the UK. 17 years ago, we launched the Friends of the Earth campaign to get rid of the remaining coal stations. And, you know, I'm glad to see that we're phasing them out now, but it has been a hell of a slog getting that logic accepted. Um, and yes, Scottish and Southern were running two stations really hard and making shed loads of money out of them. Um, they, could have, they could have shut them down a decade earlier, but the market made the, meant that they made money, so they weren't going to go against that. And that was, that was when we, I got really interested in carbon pricing and policies that would change that fundamental dynamic of running running the cheapest hardest and and you know you needed to basically price carbon at that point to get coal off the system and, and when did you make the jump to becoming the civil servant to going into uh, what was presumably DEC? Uh, it was defra at the time yeah. it was so yeah margaret beckett had just handed over the reins to david Miliband. Right. And I was seconded I was, in. You went into defra you were not at DEC. you were at DEFRA. okay i was at defra yeah yes. under david for a while well, actually, David had created this thing called the uh, Office of Climate Change, which was a cross departmental group. This is before the committee got set up and uh, it pulled in civil servants from all different departments and it was given to the OCC to write the draft bill. So I went from DEFRA to OCC, which is where. But, but how did you get into DEFRA? How did I get into DEFRA? So that was basically um, uh, a civil servant who knew me, but my friends of the earth days asking me to come in and help them run a, a communications campaign around climate change. And I went to Ian and said, look, Ian, I really want to do this. Can I have a few days off? And he said, well, look, I'll second you in. So uh, I was seconded in from SSE to do that climate change campaign. And then while I was there, it became obvious that I had a lot, I knew a fair amount about Climate Change Act. So I got moved across. Okay, and DEFRA for our audience, because I'm always just conscious that not everybody out there knows all these acronyms, um, and that is the Department of, uh, what is it? Food, Food and Rural Affairs, yeah. Rural Affairs, okay. Which was also was, looking after climate at the time. Which and was looking after climate, and, was that, and so that was that the lead department then on the Climate Change Act? Yeah, it was initially, yeah, under David. And it was, I mean, it was really interesting because Margaret Beckett had been focused on the international negotiations that was her thing you know get, trying to get Kyoto through uh, working on that and um, because it was a global problem it made sense but when David came in it, it flipped to a much more focus on what can the UK do and um, that was that was and, that, and also of course the Friends of the Earth campaign by this stage was really gathering okay, momentum. So, so that's David Miliband right? And yeah. then, but then when it got pushed through uh, into legislation that was Ed, correct? That was Ed, yes, yes. Ed had then taken over as the, the Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah, the Miliband brothers. But, it, you know, you've got to hand it to David Cameron because he played a really important role in all of this. Um, he saw the Friends of the Earth campaign as a really good opportunity to help reinvent his 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 party. So he, he came out really strongly and said, I will give you, if you elect me as your Prime Minister, I'll give you a Climate Change Act. And that's what pushed the hand of Labour into supporting it. So it was a really cross-party thing. That's interesting. So he, so David Cameron actually supported it before he was in government. He that was yeah. actually the, the see because I'm always looking for the key intervention where it's the conservatives that do all the good stuff. So now I now I know that it was neither Miliband who was key. They were just the pen pushers. They were they were the, <laughs> they were the scribes. You were the one who had your name on the document, and it was David Cameron who was the actual driving force behind this. It was, well. it was Hugger Climate Change Act. Yes, yeah. No, I think it was pure political expediency on all parts. I yes. think we were just lucky that uh, the public at large cares about climate change, right? The, it, it just, the public, the British public are well informed, despite the efforts of the deniers, you know, most people are sensible, believe the scientists and care about nature. So, so all politicians in the UK fundamentally know they've got to do the right thing. And, and then it's just about scoring points off each other, really.
Okay, so this is very interesting discussion, right? Because the 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 alternative point of view, you know, that that's a that's a very uh, reassuring point of view because that says that the public actually knows what they're doing and they are pulling the strings and the politicians are kind of having to go along and it's all fairly sort of coherent and uh, you know uh, very often I get. Um, uh, you know, non-Brits who say, oh, you know, the great thing about Britain is you have this amazing, you know, bipartisan, tripartisan, uh, cross-party consensus. And I'm like, I don't think, because the alternative view is that the whole thing is just politicians lurching from one expedient to the next and almost accidentally turning the UK into the world leader on climate change and on climate action. Um, just, you know, suddenly deciding to get rid of coal, suddenly deciding to have a floor price for carbon, suddenly deciding to have a climate change act without fully understanding that you've built in this extraordinary ratchet that means they can never stop doing these damn budgets <laughs> and making more extreme commitments. I mean, is it, is, it a, is it the UK humming along strategically or is it a sort of series of cock-ups? Um. It's it's the wisdom of the crowd really, and it's and it's a particular segment of the crowd who, who are the people who join, um, you know, friends of the earth who who pay their subs to Greenpeace who um, bother writing to their MP when they see something they're not happy about. You know, there's a there's a quite a big wedge of, of kind of the public who make themselves heard, and it's 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 been you know there's been a a sort of general educational process of having all these scientists housed here talking to us directly now we don't have to wait for the BBC to say something you can go straight to the scientists and get all the information you need that's what's fed the youth movement now getting directly all their news so it's a sort of it's, it is the public leading and the politicians following I think combined with some really sensible civil servants who have got enough knowledge about how to make change happen that when they craft policy they make sure they try to make sure that they they listen to what the incumbents telling them and then think hmm, yeah well, you would say that wouldn't you I'm actually going to do this and so that's that's a really important thing as well you've got a civil service that's knowledgeable and is and knows about how to write policy I, I mean I'm enormously reassured that you know you are you sit in the house of lords so you see this thing close up and after all these years you you do think that the system fundamentally works whereas I'm not I, I was never quite sure you know, as an outsider, much more of an outsider, you know, I could just see these sort of unexpected lurchers that I just couldn't, I, I could, can't really see where they come from. And yet they have added up to global leadership without, a, and of course, you know, it's very helpful that we've got the technologists, we've got the, uh, the we've got the city of London able to sort of hose money at things. I mean, that's all very helpful, but I, I have a much more sort of, uh, I, have a, I have a less charitable view perhaps of the process than you. Well, I mean, I, my, so I've painted a really glow, uh, sort of, um, rosy picture there. I mean, the the reality is of how how did we get to gigawatt scale um, offshore wind in the UK? Um, it came about, and I, maybe I've said this to you before, but it came about because the nuclear industry was a really effective lobby and knew exactly what to do. There's a revolving door into government. Um, when we privatised the energy system, the electricity sector, uh, obviously the, the nukes were out of the money. So they, they basically requested a policy that gave them an income to supplement uh, what they were getting when they were, where they were in, uh, in public ownership. And they created the, not, the non-fossil fuel obligation. And that then led to the off, the onshore wind. And onshore wind kind of actually, you know, it was much more successful than anyone imagined. And then the RO system came in. Um, and then we had, after that, the CFDs, right? And the CFDs were crafted and written by EDF for EDF. And they just happened to appear into a government bill um, and then again, the civil servants said, "Well, we can't just do that for nuclear. We'll do it for everything." And of course, you know that 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 system really suits big scale investment because it was designed for nuclear. So you get offshore wind as a as a as a kind of byproduct of that. So it's it's when you've got an incumbent who's you know knows how to play the system, knows how to get regulations, and and has got you know a revolving door. That's when you get these big shifts. But nobody nobody really appreciates that we've got the nuclear tank so, for that. So but you are sort of confirming that it's somewhat accidental because it didn't end up being great for nuclear. I mean, yes, EDF got, um, you know, Hinkley C, but Hinkley C in a way has just demonstrated to the world that the current generation of nuclear power stations, you know, or, you know it's just incredibly expensive and it's much better to pursue, you know, uh, wind, solar, offshore wind, and, you know, almost, I would say, absolutely anything else. But, you know, this generation of nuclear power stations yeah, but notice what's happening now, right? They've evolved again, so now they want a RAV model. 
Yes. Now they want it as a part of a regulated asset base because they know that, you know, so, so they, I mean, I, I'm, you, you probably know this, I, I am actually very supportive of nuclear. Yes, and absolutely. I, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, on, from, a, from lots of reasons we keep our nuclear capacity. So I, I'm, I'm quite relaxed. It's, it, unfortunately, building big nukes is never going to be, the market will never sustain it. Well, there are lots of political reasons why you might want it. So I'm very comfortable with us finding ways in which we can still build infrastructure that's going to last for 60, 80 years and provide reliable zero carbon electricity. And I don't really care if the economists are telling me that in the near term that doesn't make any sense, because I know long term and politically it does matter. So I'm, I'm on the record of, sort of wanting to keep nukes open for as long as safe and possible because of just the vast amounts of low carbon power they produce. And also um, to you know, push ahead with the next generation, whatever that looks like, because it may or may not work economically, but it's definitely you know, worth pursuing. And there are all these co-benefits in nuclear uh, power, uh, setting aside security, but also just you know, in, in medicine, in metrology measurements, in, in, in food industry, all sorts of things. But the current generation, I mean, these, these, this current generation of massive nuclear power stations pretty much everywhere in the world is so expensive and so uh, uh, difficult to bring in on time um, that I've essentially just said, forget it. If that's what it looks like, you know, if the logic is we're rubbish at these projects, but please give us more projects that we can improve. I've just walked away from that. I've just said, no, I just can't, I, I can't see it. I can't see it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is, if you're actually prepared to put the steel and concrete on the ground and build this thing, that's really persuasive to a government because you can you can you can intellectualize about what the ideal pathway is, uh, you know, until the cows come home. Unless you've actually got someone with the cash, with the concrete pourers, with the steel to build something, it doesn't. It's not real. So yeah, but, so they so they come along and they say to government, we want to build yeah. this thing. Uh, it's it's not perfect by any means, and I would prefer to see us have gone with a different reactor design. Don't get me wrong. I think the EPR is you know overly complex and has proven to have proven and failed. Right. We should have taken a, a leaf from the Chinese and actually waited and, and seen which ones were the quickest to get away at, at cost. And well, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been a reverse e, e, EPR. But there we go. But it, they've shown up. They want to build it. They're going yeah, but to they build don't it. Show up. They don't show up with, Brian, you know, with, with respect. They don't just show up with you know teams of you know crews of of people ready to pour concrete and do stuff. They show up first and foremost with their cap in hand and with their lobbyists. And that oh, is yeah. so but that's been true of every as a, as a, as a behavior in the you know i i just react against that and that's what and yeah. this is not an edf point it's 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 you know frankly that was how the olympics ended up in london you know it, it's so everything a major works. project turns up cap in hand schmoozing politicians ignoring the economics ignoring the cost and they just know that that, that we the public are going to end up paying for it are we not well, we're paying for our future generations. The reason we're paying a lot now is so that we can have completely free power for 20 years at the end of this or more. So I'm, I'm, that's fine. I'm very happy for this generation that's quite frankly has got rich off the back of fossil fuels to be paying a bit more back now for our children. I'm not worried about that. Anyway, we, could, we again, we could go into the... the but let, I, on my, my belief is that we need to build shed loads of zero emissions electricity and fast and if someone turns up on your doorstep and says i'm prepared to put 3.2 gigawatts of firm power on my on your system i i wouldn't turn it down i guess i would first look at well maybe the maybe the other ways of doing the same but i want to come back to something else actually which is um you know you have you you have espoused some unpopular uh, positions, right? You, you've, you've. Uh, I, I don't know, and I guess what I guess I'm trying to turn that into a question. It's like, so, sort of, do you do that on purpose? Because you've also written uh, in the Ecologist about fracking and how we shouldn't be so precious about fracking. So, you know, between uh, between nuclear and fracking, and you know, even today, you know, you, you and I have worked on a couple of things that are kind of going against the received wisdom, uh, like hydrogen in in trucking and so on. I mean, do you just do that because you enjoy being the contrarian, or because you've just kind of crunched the numbers better than everybody else and uh, have have deeper insight? It's got to be one of the two. Um, no, I'm definitely not contrarian for, for contrarian's sake. Um, my, I, I have, I'm really scared of climate change. I mean, I, I think more so than most people. And so my overriding goal is to solve that problem in as quick a time as possible. And so I don't agenda hitch lots of other issues onto it. And, and 
and a lot of a lot of the things that I think the green movement tends to take against is based on agenda hitching you know it's like oh well we don't like this because of that or oh, that's very pro-capitalist or that's um you know that's got a safety concern which is actually not real you know and so it that's what I'm object to so I, have, I suppose what I am is just very very laser like focused on climate and and therefore I do come to these you know supposedly controversial but they're not that controversial I mean if you're importing gas from America you, you, you know how can you then say that frack, a bit of fracking in Lancashire is going to end the earth you know the end of the world it's just not true and so it just annoys me when we expend political capital on these sort of fake, fake phony wars really but how have you gone through you know friends of the earth and you know coming at this from a sort of you know from from the from the left of the political spectrum without agenda hitching i mean there just aren't that many people that have managed that i haven't got time for that i mean it's just like you know i'll sort that out later we've got like honestly it it just it it came from that realization that everything i cared about was going to be devastated by this thing that's massive global experiment we were conducting with absolutely no knowledge of how it was going to play out so, uh, you know, yes, I really care about uh, equality and yes, I really care about development and I really care about biodiversity, actually, that's why I got into this thing. Um, but I'm like, that, that can all be sorted out after we've got some semblance of, of, of a solution on climate. And the other thing about climate, which is really fascinating, is though it's complicated, it can be done, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. It's just, it's just, it really isn't. There are four or five big segments of the economy that need to shift. The solutions are there. They're getting cheaper. Why? It's just just a no-brainer. So let's just do that, and then worry about all these other things that obviously are wrong with the world. But we'll have time to sort those out. That's my. <laughs> I love the word. I love the phrase agenda hitching because I, in a way, I've had a, a sort of the mirror image, and that I come from the right of the political spectrum. But there's a whole bunch of agendas there that I just, you know, I, I just reject. I'm just not interested in. Um, uh, and so I've ended up, um, you know, working on clean energy, actually, and my main driver, certainly to start with, was not actually climate at all. It was just the sheer inelegance of burning dirt and having all this pollution and all this stuff, all these clouds and so on and so on. They're just better ways of doing things, better, more mm -hmm. elegant and more economically efficient. Um, that, that we're not, so I'm, I, I come by kind of rejecting all of the corporatist notions that, you know, big business is, is always the kind of the knee jerk way to, the way to go. But I, maybe, we, but it is surprising that we've ended up um, as allies on so many uh, recent um, initiatives. And, and I want to, you know, talk about a, a couple of those. Um, nuclear, I would say broadly, we're in the same place. I think we may be not, not quite, but let's, let's talk about um, the, the shipping one where our paths hmm. crossed. And yep. uh, you've been a vocal champion of um, ammonia, the use of ammonia in shipping. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, so when I get so when I, uh, I after I'd done all this stuff and um, spent some time in the Lords, I then took a job uh, working for an environmental defence fund, which is a big US NGO, yeah, setting up their European office. And I was kind of given the task of what could we do out of our London office that would be, you know, a good thing for us to work on in climate terms. Um, and, I, and I hit on shipping because, well, A, it was a segment of the economy that got overlooked and B, the headquarters of the UN body that governs shipping was in London. So it, we had- that's the, that's the IMO, isn't it? The IMO based on the, yeah, on the, the Banks of the Thames. International Maritime Organization, yeah. And it, you know, it's a rule writing body. Um, it's a really good example of an old fashioned UN treaty where it was designed to facilitate cooperation and there was no agenda hitching. It was just, how do we make economic development happen fast? Okay, right, we need a treaty, let's do that. And uh, it was an, it's a good example of how the UN works. And I, again, I could probably go off on a tangent about how I think the UN lost its way and started trying to conflate all these goals and getting completely muddled in what it was supposed to be doing. But back then they wrote these treaties and they were quite specific. So I thought, well, that's interesting because if we could get that to tackle climate change and write a global rule book for the whole sector, that would be really efficient. And it was set. It was set in train a new uh, a kind of a new industrial revolution around fuel or a new propulsion revolution from a sector that had been hitherto ignored. So I sort of pushed EDF to to work on it, and then I got really really fascinated. And it is one of those sectors that you want to get into it. You can't can't really you never forget. Yeah. You know? So I'm still very very interested in it, and and I still believe that if we can just 
work out how to get the machinery of the IMO working, they will write laws and policies that will completely break open the hegemony of the oil market. But they've recently produced their kind of 2050 plans. I mean, it, and it doesn't go nearly far enough, does it? Well, so you've got to, yeah, you have to follow what the IMO is actually doing. You have to really get into the weeds. So they've just done this interim thing where they were setting some energy efficiency standards and they were really not great. And But the, the thing to watch is is the policies they bring in for 2023. And um, that's when they're going to start thinking about propulsion and not efficiency. And they, by then, I'm pretty confident we'll have a lot of ships who've or shippers and ship owners who've worked out that actually they can get off the horrendous, um, you know, the, the, the get off the hook of oil because that's basically that's their biggest expenditure. It's highly volatile. If they can find another way of doing it, they will. But at the moment, it is just this huge sort of subsidy for um, for for extended supply chains because if you, uh, you, you you they're just not paying the environmental cost of shipping around the world and they're using the most appalling i mean they've just tightened the rules on sulfur and on some pollutants but they're still you know horrendous compared to any sort of land-based uh, transport and and that's a form of subsidy is it not oh completely and and you know that they're, they're taking the very worst grade of fuel from the bottom of the oil refinery barrel and uh, yeah and it's it is horrendous dirt cheap though and that's why they do it and you know until they come to shore no one knows what's going on so it's uh it's it, it is it is a bit of a, a a kind of final frontier what goes out on the, but, in the ocean no one really knows but yeah and we it, have but it's regulated so you can yeah, change it if we're lucky then what we'll see is that using ammonia as the fuel will end up cheaper than using that appalling bunker fuel and that will really set the cat amongst the pigeons but it's a bit too early to see whether it can be cheaper yeah definitely too early and and at the moment okay, let, the, the the game is to try and find a way of, like we did with renewables, get them down the cost curve by bringing in a you know targeted subsidy that can pay a pretty high price to get the early early users off and away, and then the then the prices will come down. So let's talk about another one, which is um, long distance trucking, where you I'm not quite sure what your involvement uh, was, but there's um, David Sebon, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name even, uh, Sebon, uh, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at Cambridge. Yay, that's what I studied, yeah. where I studied it. Uh, and he produced this report saying that for long distance trucking in the UK, it costs a mere 20 billion pounds, which by the way, would be much cheaper than the alternatives, um, to move to uh, electric trucks being charged from overhead cables. How did you get involved in this? So this is an interesting story. Um, well, he he's a fellow at my old college and uh, I bumped into him at an event there and we, yeah. I'd Which college? I'm going to get territorial here. Que Queen. So, so was, yeah. Yeah. Where were you? I was at Christ's. That's okay. <laughs> okay. That's all right. They're, they're, it's fine. We're equivalent. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, so, so I met him there and he, he kind of buttonholed me and said, uh, you know, I'd said something about hydrogen, I think, and he said, oh, you, you know, really shouldn't talk about it that way. And it's it's only used, but it's only useful for such a small thing. You shouldn't. And so anyway, I said, well, look, yeah, absolutely. Tell, tell me more. I'd want to hear more. So he, you know, had this started this dialogue with him and he, he was uh, producing these long screeds and documents. And I said, look, David, I want to send this to people in government, uh, but you're going to have to write me a document that's really concise. It's got lots of lovely pictures. It's got some headline numbers. And I can then share it, you know, and so as the then began this process of uh, trying to get that report out and he was brilliant. I mean, he produced it without, I didn't have, you know, it didn't cost us a penny. He did it all himself. And, um, and, and it's really a brilliant report. I think I had to, I had to tone down the anti-hydrogen stuff because, you know, yes. he's really passionately anti-hydrogen and then pro catenary overheads. And it, actually, I just kept saying, be pro catenary. Don't, 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 yeah. worry about the, don't, let, don't worry about the fighting hydrogen. But he's right. You know, there is a lobby out there. It's very well resourced. And I think he feels you know, viscerally that he has to try and match that and, and not allow it to take over the lobbying. And it will if, if we're not careful. But um, yeah, yeah, Dave is amazing. But, that, but you know, and what's interesting is that in the exchanges we've had um, and with others, you know, I think it's electrifying trucking with catenary playing a role, you know, whether that's because yeah. it's en route charging or it's your or it's your predominant, uh, you know, you do the whole network. I, I'm, I don't really you know, feel strongly, but I do know that if you've got electrons and you're throwing half of them away, that's not good. So if you can use all of them and get them straight into something that, re that reduces fossil fuels, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, that makes sense to me. 
Yeah, so speaking as somebody who has dived into the economics of transportation using hydrogen and using uh, electrons, uh, it's really difficult not to be vitriolic about the stupidity of using hydrogen in any situation where electrons work. Now, there may be niches, mining vehicles or, 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 or driving across Canada or Australia in huge truck, whatever. There may be some niches, but generally you look at it and you're like, why is anybody even talking about this? And of yeah. course, very soon when you ask yourself that question, you come up against the hydrogen council, the lobbyists, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the incumbents. And it is very difficult not to become quite a sort of, um, you know, quite uh, a believer in, I don't know, uh, again, my sort of, you know, my view that, that, that the progress is, is, is despite rather than because of any rationality. I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's hard not to get cynical when you see that, to be honest. Yeah, but, you know, look at buried in the 10 point plan was this little line about a, a trial starting on catenary overheads and yes. and yes. and hydrogen. So somebody somewhere has read David's report, realized well, that he's, you know, so I, I do feel how can like I there put is... this, Brani, how can I put this? I may know who read it. <laughs> and it I may have been involved. Oh, well, I'm so who knows? Who knows? Great. Nobody knows how this stuff works. But I think no. what's also interesting is we're also, uh, uh, I think this is the day when the government said that their transport decarbonisation plan was going to be delayed until the spring of next year. So I think we've got another few months reprieve where we could try to put some good data and, and logic and information out there uh, about what might work. And you know, it's, this is one of the areas where we've got to do it with our European partners. Also an interesting day, given that Boris right now is having dinner with um, with the president of the EU, um, because you know you can't do long distance trucking off on your own using a different gauge of railway to the rest of Europe. We're going to have to move in some way in convoy, I think. Yeah, well, and that's the interesting thing about transport, really, is that going back to multilateralism in the UN, I don't think there's been a UN uh, proper treaty on transport for decades. Like it, it's, it's it's always been a domestically thought about issue. And, they, and there's no reason why we couldn't start a plurilateral or a multilateral process on decarbonizing transport that helped set standards internationally that everyone could use. That's, that's exactly why shipping has a treaty. It's why aviation has a treaty. Why don't we do one for land-based transport yeah, well, I mean, where we standardize be, things? You know, whether it should be the UN or whether that's because fundamentally land-based transport tends to be regional. So whether that's the right vehicle. I'm very interested in, you know, what could the WTO potentially do? Mm. Uh, because, I, you know, my, my role on the board of trade, in fact, you know, uh, I should probably uh, I should probably be asking you what you think I should be doing on the board of trade, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, particularly the shipping and transportation side of things. Um, uh, if you have any thoughts now, well, I, I'm, I, you know, I, my belief is that trade is facilitated by good common standards that allow that 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 grease the wheels of commerce. That's why there's an IMO. That's why there's an ICAO for for aviation. It just it helps if you've got common standards yeah. and everyone can move forward on. And so I, I actually do think that you know trade deals, bilateral ne negotiations are you know they're a way of moving things forward, but far better. To try and get something that lifts all that lifts all the boats everywhere. So I I, I don't have I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about because it, 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 it trade you know often it ends up being arguments about tariffs or you, what you can do to get through the WTO rules and it feels very regressive and not particularly positive. I like I like laws that change things in a positive way. Yeah. So I I suppose that's my well, answer my, is my exam question on the board of trade is how can we make trade work as a race to the top environmentally and on climate rather than a race to the bottom um so um but maybe I, I won't put you on the spot on that one that is i'm sure that our paths will cross on that question and others you know because we're, yeah. we're we're reaching uh, the end of the allotted time and i just want to ask you okay so uh, i know that you, and you you said that you were at um, the uh, environmental defense fund for i think you were there for four years but you now do uh, a bunch of things. You're still uh, involved with Ember, which is a produces fabulous data. Um, you're advising Quadrature, uh, which seems to be you know making some quite substantial grants. Uh, what, what's your theory of change for you know for Bryony now? What's the what's the biggest lever that you've got, and why and 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 how are you trying to sort of you know accelerate the the issues that you care about on, on climate? Well, it's uh, yeah. So I have got this new role that I've uh, took on this year, where I'm advising two uh, two really great 
um, philanthropists in their in their giving to climate, and they've said, you know, all the money they want to spend is on climate mitigation. So um, yeah, we've got the challenge of working out how to spend that money wisely. And I suppose it comes back to what I said at the start: is that you know we we can as civil society really move things because because politicians are really followers not leaders in this current in the way that they currently operate and so the NGO movement and the not-for-profit sector is really influential and so what I'm trying to work on is how do we maximize political leverage of that baseline of concern so that baseline of concern translates into good policies and good regulations that allows all the technologies we've talked about to flourish and to kick out the incumbents so that's that's the big meta picture okay. and so if you were to what you've got all the, you've got these funds to disperse what would what sorts of things are you going to fund and you know you're going to have people listening to this who are thinking you know either yes that you know they could apply or or, or, or no they couldn't what sort of things are you looking for what would you love to see in your email tomorrow morning well at the moment I'm looking for an ember for agriculture. So, an ember, so ember is taking a data-based approach, correct? Right. Yeah. So I'm, I am a little bit obsessed about data into action. You know, not just data for data's sake, but data to tell a story, to drive an agenda, to move it, to move people's understanding of a problem. And Ember has been doing that on coal, uh, you know, since we set it up and uh, in its new, new, it was sandbag and now it's Ember. Um, and you know that that sort of analytical approach in the power sector is now really well served, but when I turn to agriculture, it's just not there. You know, there's 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 academics doing good work, and there's you know research scientists and agronomists and all sorts. But where's the campaign that takes all that knowledge about how agriculture is basically contributing to climate change and getting rid of a lot of our biodiversity, and turns that into campaignable asks that can be then delivered by politicians. And I'm working on how do we get that going and uh, with, with a very, very, very strong focus on climate. That's the thing. Because there does seem to be there's a sort of rewilding movement and then there's the there's the eat less meat movement and there's the, there's all sorts of bits. There's a bit of soil carbon movement, but there's nobody across it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, we've been looking for some wedge analysis of like where are the sensitive intervention points? What's the easiest wins? What's the coal equivalent? Right. And it probably is. I mean, it might be that we all stop eating beef burgers, right? But I want someone to be able to tell me that with data and, and analysis and, and show that that's all possible yeah. and we can get those emissions down fast. Um, My so, sense but, is we need large ruminants as well in order to have biodiversity. You can't do, if we all went vegan, you wouldn't have biodiversity because there'd be, there'd be stuff missing from the, uh, uh, from, from the, but, but that, you know, who knows? Um, yeah. And, and it the might, data, and, you as know, you say. Yeah, and, and actually what I what I truly believe is that, and, and it's got a bit of a bad reputation, but eco-modernism, which is this marrying of really intensive use of a technology yeah. with rewilding yeah. um, is is the is the way forward. Because That's, if you because if I, you take your pressure off land, you'd be able to do more for nature. Can I can I sell my movement, which is eco-pragmatism? And the reason okay. I the reason I react to eco-modernism is that Every single eco-modernist I've ever interacted with, in the end, has attacked renewable energy. Every single one, and it's except for, except to be fair, if they're Finnish, Finnish <laughs> eco-modernists are cool, and all other eco-modernists have ended up just trying to you know to just trying to sort of throw shade at solar and the most you know stupid uh, you know uh, in the in the most absurd way uh, and so i'm i'm done with eco modernism some time ago but eco pragmatism and let's just get the data and do the obvious things but that i think you would probably endorse right oh yeah completely and uh, we've been calling it uh, science led uh, approaches yeah. or uh, technology neutral evidence, approaches or evidence-based evidence -based I mean, policy whatever you can call it yeah. what you like yeah, yeah. It, yeah. and that's Good. why i say i think eco-modernism has definitely um well, suffered from some of its its agenda hitching possibly i don't know so brianie that is a fantastic uh, note on which to finish evidence-based policy but i think we also see a real can-do attitude there in your remarks so it's not just fiddling at the edges with small bits of evidence and small moves it's about big chunks of evidence and big moves and so what you're saying is if anybody can prove that anybody's got the data sets to do that in agriculture they should email you 
uh, and, uh, and, and just in general, I'm sure that you'll continue to work on all sorts of things. Our paths will cross and I really look forward to it. It's an absolute, it's an absolute delight working with you, Bryony. Well, no, thank you. And uh, apologies for various doors slamming and children arriving and all the usual things that come with well, don't, that. Don't say that. We'll probably manage to edit that out. But if not, oh, okay. if not that's absolutely not a problem because uh, that's the world we live in and it's all the better for it. It is, exactly. All the carbon we're saving. Well, look, no, thank you. And it's been a delight. And, it, and I hope our paths do continue to cross because there's lots to be done. Um, but I think we've got the wind with us at the moment. The headwinds are subsiding and we've got some good tailwinds. So let's go for it. Very good. Thank you very much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Baroness Brownie Worthington, uh, lead author on the historic 2008 Climate Change Act in the UK. But as you can see, in no way resting on her laurels, still very much involved in all sorts of issues across the environment, but particularly climate change. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Minister of State for Pacific and the Environment in the FCDO. That's the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office under the Boris Johnson government. He's also a minister at DEFRA. That's the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. He's a lifelong environmentalist. He's a former editor of The Ecologist magazine. He's been an MP and he's also been the Conservative mayoral candidate. Please join us at this time next week for a conversation with Lord Zach Goldsmith.